Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know by now, because the Writer's Block is in its 25th year, I interview writers and sometimes other artists about their craft, what they're working on now, what they've accomplished in the past, and what they might be planning for their future works. We've had on poets, we've had on novelists, short story writers, uh, journalists, editors, all sorts of writers, and we also spring for various other kinds of artists sometimes. We've had on uh, visual artists, we've had on composers, musicians, actors. It's a very, very wide net. So if you have an idea for someone who might be right for the writer's block, watch for our address at the end of the program. We'd be very happy to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the Writer's Block is a production of Cape Ann TV, and that means it's one of the cable access programs generated for Cape Ann right here on Cape Ann. This is a service that does not come with DISH, so don't be tempted to move from cable. This is a wonderful community access uh, uh, feature of cable, and we hope that you stay one of our viewers. Tonight, I'm happy to say we do have a writer, a lady who was a previous guest on the show by the name of Marjorie Leach. And I always love to have Marjorie on the show because she's very bright, very active, very energetic, 90-year-old. And uh, uh, we younger uh, folks like to look up to uh, older uh, writers to be inspired. I'm going to read her intro from the back of her latest book, which is on being born again and again. That's the title, on being born again and again. And I think Liz has got a good shot of that. Thank you. In 1982, newly widowed Marjorie McManus Leach began a life of travel that opened her eyes to many injustices in the world. Called by her conscience not to be silent after hearing testimony of Marshall Islanders displaced by nuclear testing, she began sharing locally her National Council of Churches overseas seminars through slide programs and before long expanded her lecture circuit nationwide. Settling in Phoenix in 1992, she volunteered for the Valley Religious Task Force on Central America and was soon documenting in newsletters and journal report trips made with several peace organizations to Guatemala, Cuba, and the indigenous areas of Chiapas, Mexico. How did she get to Gloucester? Well, in 2006, following an injury in Chiapas, Leach retired to Gloucester, Massachusetts, and now celebrates her life in poetry with the newly published Captured this is an earlier book, Captured by Long Icy Winter, uh, on being born again and again is a revision and continuation of after the tumultuous events of September 11, 2001, of her initial autobiography, Unexpected Harvest. Welcome to the show again, Marjorie. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, that introduction mentioned briefly that you uh, write poetry. Yeah. as well as yeah. Yeah. biography right. and, uh, and, other, uh, and other writing. And you brought down a poem that's fresh off the, uh, fresh off the typewriter. Uh, I, I was pleasantly surprised you gave me this uh, before the show started. Uh, would you share this uh, I certainly poem will. called Falling Leaves? Most of my writing comes from something I see. And this morning, I was looking at falling leaves, November 11th, 2014. Leaves are falling, gently falling, not being yanked by ferocious winds, but lightly tumbling, landing where they will or not. Some in bunches under bushes, others singly between blades of grass. Many still watch from high above, clinging to trees that gave them birth. What will happen when they finally let go? No more, no less than all the rest. Who can say which is best? With one life, all are blessed. Very nice. Thank you for bringing that down. Uh, 
I enjoyed the fact that you brought that down because I was that's exactly what I was doing a couple of times today, <laughs> watching <laughs> the maple leaves just sift down just, in almost yeah. calm air, yeah. um, deciding deciding where to go. Go, yeah. <laughs> Most of them on my front porch, I think. <laughs> Tell me about this book, uh, which I held up uh, on being born again and again. Okay. Now, what do you want me well, to tell you well, about it? <laughs> there's a great deal in here about uh, Mexico and your experience right. in Chiapas. Yes, yes, and yes. I've known people, my wife and others, who have been down that part of Mexico. I was particularly interested in that section, but I, I, I uh, would like yeah. you to describe when you started this okay. and when, uh, when you finished it, that process. Well, you mean started writing the book yeah. or when these things started happening? Well, the book itself. Because the you, book yeah. itself. Well, I think it, actually, I think it was around the turn of the century, you know, when we went into 2000, 2001. It's hard to say because I was writing the poetry then. I had just finished publishing The Unexpected Harvest. But The Unexpected Harvest was a total autobiography at the time, starting when I, when I was very young, you know, all the trials of childhood, etc., and through two marriages, and then my life after that, the whole thing. And I felt like I needed, especially after 2001, that's really what spurred it, when the uh, bombs were dropped in uh, New York City. Or the planes. Uh, the planes. Uh -huh. Yeah, the planes came down, yeah. right. I've even forgotten what it was, but I know it was a real shakeup for everybody in this country. Uh -huh. We just could not imagine such a thing happening in our life. So to me, that really was just a very life-changing event, like everybody else. But I felt that that was my signal then to sort out this stuff that was in my latter life that I really feel kind of let up to a terrible event like that. I mean, that's, that's how it started. But it, actually, I go back then and pick up in the original Unexpected Harvest uh, that period of time and try to fill in some of the things that happened during that period. So that's... that's and up to 2006 when you came to, uh, came to Gloucester. 2006, is that when I came to Gloucester? <laughs> Um, I wrote about this in between both places. I mean, because I was coming to Gloucester before then, part of the time. In fact, at that point, I was living in Gloucester five months of the year and living in Phoenix for seven months of the year. And that um, kind of shaped my life, but that meant that the fair weather times when I didn't want to be in hot Phoenix. <laughs> I had a very wonderful place to spend the summer and the time to read and write. And do you miss, in the middle of a Gloucester winter, do you miss some of that heat in Phoenix? Well, <laughs> I came back once for Thanksgiving during that period of about, I actually moved to Phoenix about 201 and then I didn't come to Gloucester to stay for a long period of time until the, that two, 206. Yeah, you know, I get a little bit. So the, so the, the, uh, the tragedy of the attack on, in New York and the Pentagon uh, jarred you into reevaluating uh, right. some of these uh, activities you had been involved in right. and then continued to be involved right. in. Right, yeah, yeah. Explain the title. On being born again and again. Well, if you read the book, every once in a while, when something new happens and my life kind of makes a change, I thought, you know, it's like being born again because your life changes so much. Now, with some people, it might be just the change of a job. You know, you go someplace else, you meet a whole new bunch of people, you start doing things differently. It's sort of like that. I'm not, you know, it's, this is not a religious thing. It's uh, the changes in your life that make you feel that you're doing things so much differently than you did before. Is that how you keep your enthusiasm? Oh, I imagine so, yeah. You know, life is meant for change. I mean, life is change. You, you wouldn't live if we didn't, we wouldn't grow if we didn't change all the time. 
And some people don't like change, you know, it's very it's disturbing. They are afraid of it. This is another problem with uh, many people is they have so much fear in their lives. And these are things that somehow or other I have jettisoned along the way. And I can just... You must, you must have gotten rid of your TV. <laughs> That's a big source of fear for many people. Well, uh, actually, I moved from in this transfer between Phoenix and Gloucester. Um, one of the times I was in Gloucester, my TV in Phoenix was stolen. <laughs> my, my, Phoenix, my, my TV and my uh, radio that, um, well, it did more than just what a, what a plain radio does. You play, play discs on it, you know, mm -hmm. little you know, things like that. Those two things were stolen while I was gone. So that, that meant when I came to live in Gloucester, I did not have a television. Did you replace it? No. Do you have a TV now? No. Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> I think that's why you're not afraid of things. Because there's nothing but yeah. fear-mongering fear to sell products. Oh, I know. It just, it just hits at you all the time, that constant terrible things that are happening. And, you know, I pick up the good things that are happening. I, I observe the bad things, and, but I also see the good things that come. And that's one of the things, I think, that turns around in your life, is that you're going along and then something happens and, oh, you're really shook. But after you take and don't get thrown by it too much, you take new steps to get beyond that, and your life changes. So change is very frequently tied to disappointments. And getting over them. Yes. Well, yeah. I, I really uh, I wanted to ask you about that. I'm glad you could explain that more because I know so many people who are younger than I or older than I yeah. who are just depressed as hell about being old. Yeah. Because y yes, it's, right. not, oh. it's not really fun. <laughs> no, <laughs> your body, no. Your body starts to... Uh, Right. A little uh, edgy, um, but you seem to have uh, weathered those uh, those storms. A lot of those storms. Well, I look at them differently than a lot of people do. I mean, I try to look beyond what you can do, not what you cannot do. You must. You may have to leave some of those things that you really love doing, but if you venture out, then you find something else that's. You know better. I, I think in just one little incident in, in the book there, and it's way into the book, when I made the decision to come back from Phoenix permanently and stay here in mm -hmm. Gloucester. I was in Phoenix and I was uh, went back to take a, what I considered would be a last trip. I'd been down to Chiapas many times and I was getting older and I was settling down more and spending more time in Gloucester. And I thought I would like to go once more, once more. And there was a trip offered with the, uh, uh, I don't know, it was Pastors for Peace, but one of the groups that I had been traveling with. And um, I thought, now, we go around and we see certain aspects that are there. We listen to people, what their lives are like, etc. But I'm always taking notes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I want, these were meetings, and I wanted some time there when I would be alone and could go back to some of these places and just spend some time in the village and, you know, make the contacts that I had made through the group that would help me because I don't speak Spanish, and, but I managed to get along. And so um, uh, this particular time I wanted to go back and go with the group over New Year's Eve and then stay maybe for a couple of weeks. So ask, ask the leader about this fellow that I call him my, um, oh dear, Piper. The, Piper? You know, the, the, the guy who, who lures you. Pied Piper? The Pied Piper, I call him my Pied Piper. <laughs> yeah. You call up on the phone and say, Marjorie, we got a trip to such and such, and don't you want to go? It's going to make history. <laughs> that was always the key. It was going to make history. Something was down there. So at any rate, we were going down there to celebrate over the New Year's the Zapatista rebellion in Mexico down in Chiapas. This it had been, I don't know how many years, maybe about 10 years since the uh, thing had happened. 
maybe five, I don't know. But at any rate, so I went down there for that special occasion, and I, then I thought, well, maybe I'll stay. And he said, well, I, for a couple of weeks, he said, I think you better wait and make that decision, because I wanted some ideas of him, from him of where I could stay and stuff. I think you better do that. Well, I get down there. Unfortunately, the one thing that I've been dreading on all these trips I was taking was missing a flight to get to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I did. I missed the flight in Mexico City because the one up in Dallas was late. I had to spend the night in Mexico City, and I don't, and never wanted to have to spend the night in a hotel in Mexico City. But I had to do it, and I did it. But that meant I got down to San Cristobal, which is the area in Chiapas that we have our headquarters, and then go from there into Chiapas to different villages. And I get there, oh, maybe around lunchtime, so I went out for lunch. I had not missing my plane and all that. My meals were all off. So I went <clears throat> out for lunch, and on the way back, crossing these narrow streets, and the lights would change, and I was, had my eyes on the lights and the cars I knew that were waiting to make those crossings, and I stumbled. And I went down, and I hit my leg. And I had a, it was only about a half a block from where we were staying, but that was pretty bad. And I realized, not right away, but within a day or so, that I would not be able to even finish the weekend, let alone the extra two weeks did, I wanted. Did you break something? Or was it, it didn't break, but it did injure, and I still work. have, you know, I, uh -huh. I, I still have knee, knee troubles from that. But um, staying over, I met people that have carried on in what I do afterwards. And I just something else happens whenever something bad happens. And if you just pick up on it and don't dwell on, you know, your injury or your disappointment or whatever, and that's how life changes for me. Changes, you say. Yeah. I want to point out that you have in here a, uh, uh, the, the book is indexed, and also there are, I want to find that map of Chiapas. Which is very helpful to follow your <laughs> maybe you gotta your look adventures. At yeah. uh, now I'm not gonna. Maybe you got to look at the there. tape. There, oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh no, this is a well uh, well turned out book. I'm gonna just show this uh, map, uh, general map of uh, Mexico on the viewer's left, and then a more specific map of uh, this is Mexico, and then Chiapas, which is. Quite a ways down. It's the southernmost uh, state in next to Guatemala in in Mexico. And it, I know Oaxaca is, uh, is just above it. Uh, just, yeah, just uh, just above it. So it's quite a ways south of Mexico City. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a long flight, and if you miss it, <laughs> it's disappointing. <laughs> uh, tell us about the um, the the work uh, that your group was. You said Pastors for Peace. Well, that's what it's, the first group that I went down with was Pastors for Peace. Yeah. Uh, Lucius Walker, who um, founded IFCO, International Foundation for Community Organizing, uh, out of New York. He's a black man, and he was very interested in um, minorities being able to organize and, you know, make their lives better. And um, he got interested in the um, well. I've lost it there. The uh, the the poverty in Chiapas. I think you talk about that. Uh, he got down to Nicaragua. That's where it was. He went to Nicaragua, and he was shot by U.S. forces when this was during the time that Nicaragua was trying to vote in their own people and, and the U.S. government had been backing the dictator that was down there. So we had forces, the U.S. had forces on the ground in Nicaragua. And he got shot, I don't remember. Actually, it was a ferry boat that, that was gunned by the <clears throat> the uh, military in Nicaragua, but these were people who had been trained by the U back in the U.S. And so as he's, he's lying in bed, 
after this wound and thinking that his taxes paid for that, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the ammunition and all that that did that. And, and that's how he started Pastors for Peace. Uh -huh. He started bringing groups down to these different countries, bring, usually uh, to bring things that they needed, but also to see what they needed, see what the situation was. So I went on a number of trips with him and um, Tom Hansen was the guy who directed them. I mean, <clears throat> I wonder if there's a passage you could read to us, a paragraph or two that sort of sums up for you your uh, your intent or your tone uh, in in the book. <laughs> wow, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, uh, Here. Well, I don't know about the tone, but how about if I just read you one little spot here when I went to Korea. Now, this uh, is what an, page are you on? Please? I'm on page 44. We had been traveling around Korea, and um, we were ready to leave. Uh, at Korea at this point, this must have been about 1984, and Korea was still somewhat under a dictatorship okay. then. At the airport on departure, we were alarmed when my roommate Marion Hart was singled out to have her luggage searched in a closed room. The previous afternoon, while visiting the headquarters of a Presbyterian denomination that was supportive of those being oppressed by the government, we had been asked to do something risky. They wanted us to smuggle out envelopes addressed to persons outside Korea. The envelopes contain newsletters about abuses of power. And then I'm going to skip down to the next paragraph. We were concerned not just that we too might be led off and arrested or our flight delayed, but what might happen to the brave Christians responsible for assembling the newsletter. During Marion's absence, we acted as nonchalantly as possible through inwardly, though inwardly agonizing until our companion reappeared. She had been seized to have her stuff um, inspected mm -hmm. at the airport. Um, when safely on, the, on board the plane, I finally dared whisper, what happened? With a deadpan face, Marion replied, they search every bag thoroughly except my purse. That's where I put the envelopes when I picked them up, and I never thought to move them. We had had a taste of the tightrope some people walk every day. So this is a little bit like, it reads in sections like a little spy novel. You're, yeah. you're smuggling through uh, government <laughs> lines. Well, uh, this, <laughs> Forbidden uh, material, forbidden literature. You know, we're supposed to have freedom of speech, but we don't want other people to know what the truth. And North Koreans didn't want. Or this was not they, North not, Korea. This, this was South, South Korea. Korea. I just, I, I just got the three-minute signal from, oh dear. from Liz, our camera person. Um, I want to be. I'm going to have to begin to uh, to wrap up. Yeah, uh, Marjorie, this has been fun. On being born again and again is a book about your adventures. And you can see from that passage, some of them are pretty adventurous yeah, uh, over the yeah. last several decades that you were moved to kind of summarize after the, uh, the terrorist attack right. in uh, 9, yeah, nine yeah. one. Uh, Where is this book available? Where, is, where can we get it? Well, you can get it in the library. <laughs> the li is it? I don't know whether you can get it in the bookstore or not, but you can certainly get it through Amazon.com or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Just so go to the internet. We'll get on Amazon, probably Barnes and Noble too. Yeah. So we have to see that after you uh, are presented on our program, if the sales just oh, go, yeah. go sky okay. high. <laughs> Thanks very much for well, coming. Well, thank down you. Here. I'm always glad to share this information. And I meant I meant what I said that you're an inspiration to us, yeah. <laughs> to us young kids. Your memory is a lot better than my am. I am well. uh, at the present time. I appreciate you coming down. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to thank everybody out in uh, television uh, land as well. Uh, if you've learned something 
about Marjorie Leach's adventures uh, over the last uh, couple of de decades and got a sense of, uh, of her uh, energy and uh, brightness, then the writer's block has done its job. And if you like tonight's show, I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night. <laughs>